Hello, I'm Dr. Alan Blum, Professor and Gerald Leon Wallace Endowed Chair in Family Medicine at the University of Alabama College of Community Health Sciences, where I direct the Center for the Study of Tobacco in Society. This exhibition traces the phenomenon of cigarette smoking from its rise in popularity in the 1920s and 1930s to its ongoing widespread use today. As this exhibition illustrates through more than 130 artifacts and images, the tobacco industry never let up in its marketing prowess. Thus, this exhibition poses the question, the Surgeon General versus the Marlboro Man. Who really won? We set the stage of cigarettes in popular culture in the 1930s through the 1950s, when little Johnny, the mascot for Philip Morris cigarettes, could say graduate to Philip Morris with college students depicted in a cigarette ad on their graduation day. The Crimson White, the newspaper of the University of Alabama, contained upwards of four cigarette advertisements in every issue, such as this one from Little Johnny. A child growing up in the 1930s and 40s could open up the Sunday Funnies and see underneath Mutt and Jeff an advertisement for Camel cigarettes featuring Joe DiMaggio saying, I can smoke as many as I please. A child going into a store could pick up a pack of candy cigarettes, Camel, Cool, Marlboro, all the brands in it, packages almost identical to the real ones. Banks were sold where you could put in a penny and get out a package of Lucky Strike. Willie the Penguin was a featured uh, character in Cool Cigarettes throughout the 1930s, 40s, and 1950s when doctors could go to medical meetings and receive a figurine of Willie the Penguin or in the Saturday Evening Post learn that Dr. Cool recommended Cools and he'll be all right. Actors and actresses like Ronald Reagan could be enlisted to promote cartons of cigarettes for Christmas, and even Santa Claus got in on the act by saying that Luckies were easy on his throat. In the 1940s and 1950s, when the early health reports showing the adverse health consequences of smoking began to be published in popular media, such as Life magazine, the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company decided to use doctors in its campaign. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette was the theme for upwards of 10 years. In 1954, the tobacco industry published a frank statement to cigarette smokers in newspapers throughout the United States in which they promised to remove anything that might be causing cancer and assure the public that cigarette smoking could be made safe. Among the innovations the tobacco companies came up with was the cigarette filter. One of the early cigarette filters was the Kent Micronite filter, advertised as so safe, so pure, it's used to filter the air in many hospitals. And what was it made of? Asbestos. Doctors could go to medical meetings and be given their own embossed case with two packs of Kent and the story of Kent cigarettes. Medical journals such as the Journal of the American Medical Association advertised cigarettes through 1954. This was a Journal of the American Medical Association ashtray. Even Time magazine in its medicine section was sponsored by cigarette companies such as Viceroy. Nurses became targets for cigarette marketing as well as this advertisement in RN magazine shows. And the candy striper walking through the corridors of University of Alabama at Birmingham Hospital in the 1950s and 60s selling a carton of cigarettes to the patients. By the 1950s, there was no longer any doubt about the devastating impact of smoking. Magazines such as Consumers Reports ran front page cover stories on cigarette smoking and lung cancer, as did the Reader's Digest. Roy Knorr, an unsung hero from the early 1950s, published a crusading newsletter against the tobacco industry and cigarette advertising. And he wrote an article called Cancer by the Carton that was reprinted in Reader's Digest after it originally appeared in the Christian Herald. U.S. News and World Report did an in-depth investigation on smoking and lung cancer and tried to get the word out. Meanwhile, the tobacco industry planted articles in magazines such as True to convince the public that you could smoke without fear. They hired authors such as Albert Astro to write books such as Why Stop Smoking? The tobacco industry even hired away the former president of the American Cancer Society, Clarence Cook Little, to issue a pamphlet questioning the evidence on smoking and lung cancer. 
A major event occurred in 1962 with the publication of the report Smoking and Health by the Royal College of Physicians. This inspired tremendous activity on the part of health professionals in Great Britain to oppose smoking. A reporter, Edgar Prinner, asked President Kennedy at a press conference in 1962 what the American government was going to do about cigarette smoking, and this led to the formation by the Surgeon General of an advisory committee to investigate smoking and health. No sooner did President Kennedy launch the effort to study smoking and health in the United States than the tobacco industry gave the American Medical Association upwards of $5 million to do its own research. This led the AMA, when the Surgeon General's report was released, to not endorse the report, but to claim that it needed more research. Fifteen years later, the AMA issued its own report saying not only did smoking cause lung cancer, but also heart disease. A memo in 1982 from the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association, George Lundberg, still warned staffers of the journal to be very careful about publishing articles on smoking, nuclear war, and abortion, because these issues were extremely sensitive to members of the Board of Trustees of the American Medical Association. Even when the health problems associated with smoking became widely known among physicians and researchers in the 1940s and 1950s, the tobacco industry remained resilient, overtly and quietly questioning the evidence and undermining what we were beginning to know. January 11, 1964, the State Department, Washington, D.C. The Surgeon General, Dr. Luther Terry, holds a press conference. Packed to the brim, the reporters were locked in the room and given one and a half hours to read the report and then to pose questions to Dr. Terry. This is the letter that was sent by Dr. Terry the following week to every physician in the United States along with a copy of the report, urging physicians to read and look at the conclusions and to act accordingly. Every major newspaper in the United States covered the report in banner headlines across the front pages. That very evening, the Detroit News said, U.S. plans legal war to cut cigarette smoking. The next morning, its sister newspaper said, U.S. report indicts cigarettes. The New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Dallas Morning News, all created major stories on cigarette smoking. A photograph on the front page of the New York Journal American showed the members of the committee uh, with the report and the ashtrays on the table as they deliberated. The publication of the Surgeon General's report on smoking and health in 1964 sent reverberations around the world and began to change public awareness, attitudes, and behavior towards cigarette smoking. There are many ways we could have illustrated the way in which cigarette smoking has been regarded since the publication of the Surgeon General's report, but we chose three themes. The impact of smoking among women is a prominent theme. In 1968, Philip Morris Tobacco Company introduced Virginia Slims, and they created a sense of tying in with women's liberation. As soon as the cigarette was created with the slogan, you've come a long way, baby, the company created a tennis tournament because cigarette advertising had been banned in 1969 and no sooner than it went into effect in 1971 than the Virginia Slims Cigarettes Tennis Tournament appeared televised across the United States. The tournament featured such stars as Billie Jean King who became a board member of Philip Morris and an ardent supporter of the cigarette company. When Philip Morris began the Virginia Slims Tennis Tournament, one of the early beneficiaries was the American Cancer Society. In the 1990s, the famous model Iman could be featured in a Virginia Slim cigarette advertisement. In the early 2000s, the advertisements appealed to people of color and became even more glamorous. Find Your Voice was the theme for Virginia Slims, even though laryngeal cancer is a major problem caused by cigarette smoking. In the 1930s, Women were depicted in cigarette advertisements in a very glamorous way. In Chesterfield advertising, a young lady could say, after a man's heart. The advertisement appeared both in the Saturday Evening Post and also in the New York State Journal of Medicine. In 1983, when I edited the New York State Journal of Medicine first theme issue 
on the tobacco pandemic. I use this image on the cover. By that point, we had learned an enormous amount about smoking's devastating impact on the heart. That issue of the New York State Journal of Medicine and a subsequent one were the first two issues devoted entirely to the tobacco pandemic of any medical journals in the United States. They led to a book called The Cigarette Underworld. Although the media did cover smoking extensively following the publication of the Surgeon General's report, it always seemed to give the cigarette companies the final say. And so we see examples of magazines with front cover stories on cancer and heart disease and women's health, and on the back cover, cigarette advertisements. In the late 1980s, I had a conversation with Gloria Steinem when she appeared on WNYC radio, and I posed the question how she could include cigarette advertisements in the health issue of Ms. Magazine. She became angry and said, would you rather us not publish, implying that this magazine could not have existed were it not for the support of the cigarette companies. In its entire history, Ebony Magazine has never published a single article on cigarette smoking and yet it continues to this day to feature cigarette advertisements in nearly every issue, including a cover story on the war on drugs while selling you Salem cigarettes on the back cover. A cover story on cigarette smoking in Newsweek in 1977 asked, what causes cancer? And inside, the article included a table with the top 10 causes of cancer shown in alphabetical order. Arsenic and asbestos were numbers one and two. Tobacco smoke was number eight. Although the National Review would question the evidence on secondhand smoke as causing harm to health, the fact that they would run an advertisement for Benson and Hedges cigarettes on the back cover clearly shows who was behind the National Review's editorial policy. The success of the tobacco industry can be reflected today in this overview of Marlboro country. Beginning in the 1950s when Marlboro changed from a woman's cigarette, mild as may, red tips to match your pretty lips, to the macho Marlboro cowboy, we see an incredible marketing effort that has made Marlboro the number one cigarette in the world and among the very top brands of any kind in the world. The Marlboro Cowboy on his horse morphed into many other images, such as the Marlboro race car, Marlboro soccer, Marlboro skiing. You could see the Marlboro advertisements on billboards from the back of stadiums. The Marlboro brand was the number one in the world in the 1990s and still is very high up on the list today. And the Crimson White still features advertisements for Philip Morris in the form of its new named company, Altria. Sounds like altruistic. Altria comes on over 25 college campuses each year at career fairs to recruit college students to become Marlboro Territory salespeople to sell Marlboro cigarettes to the least educated and the poorest among our population. Philip Morris did claim in the 1990s that it would stop production if its products were found to cause cancer. They never did. From the 1930s when cigarettes were advertised in campus newspapers to the present day, when cigarette companies can come on college campuses and recruit students to become salesmen for cigarettes, we really haven't evolved as well as we've thought. Laughter may be the only solution, and that's why we conclude this exhibition with a spoof by Doc of Barfboro, a way perhaps to laugh the pushers out of town. Thank you for joining me on this gallery tour of the exhibition Dr. Luther Terry and the landmark Surgeon General's Report on Smoking and Health. I hope the exhibition has stimulated your thinking and has posed provocative questions. If you do have comments and questions, please write to me at ablum at cchs.ua.edu.